Well, this evening, as I've already mentioned, we're continuing our study in the Ten Commandments from the perspective of the New Covenant and what it is that uh, God has done within us to give us the grace to do what He calls us to do and remembering, too, that the, the commandments and holiness in general is really just another word for love. This is the law of love. This is how we love the Lord. This is how we love our neighbor by observing these commandments and thankfully the Lord has given to us grace in the new covenant to be able to do this not just uh, what's what I'm looking for hypocritically not just putting on the shell of, of obedience but actually doing these things from the heart because that's what we desire to do well this evening we're going to be looking at the seventh commandment in Exodus 20 verse 14 you shall not commit adultery well, may the Lord bless our understanding of this commandment. And again, it's, it's a fairly broad commandment like the others, and it goes beyond just the words of the commandments, and we do need to understand what it calls us to do. Now, this morning, as I've already mentioned, uh, we saw that we are to love God by protecting His image. Man is that image. God made man in His image so that He might have fellowship with man. And we need to understand it's not because God needed fellowship. I mean, there are those who at least have taught in church history, perhaps some who believe this today, that God did what he did because he had to do it. He had some kind of a need that he needed to meet, but we need to understand God has no needs. God basically is a full cup. He can't be any more blessed than he already is. He doesn't need us. But because God is a full cup, because He is so blessed, He created man and entered into a relationship with man because man needed Him. Now, He has blessed us. He has blessed really His whole creation, but particularly man in making us in His image by giving Himself to us through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's because we are the image of God and have been given this great privilege that we are to protect life. We are to protect our lives. We are to protect the lives of others. Remember we saw this morning, you shall not murder. And so not only must we not take life away unjustly, we're also not to do anything that tends in that direction. We are not to harm others. We are not to harbor hateful thoughts about them. We are not to harbor desires to harm people or to hurt them through our words, which are really an expression of what's in our hearts, which if we spew out things that are damaging, it's only because we hate them in our hearts. But the Lord reminds us that we are to love all, even our enemies. So instead of harming them, we need to do what we can to protect their lives, to preserve their lives, as well as our own. And instead of tearing down one another with our words or injuring others, we are to minister to them with our words, particularly through the gospel, the words that ultimately will heal their souls. Now this evening, let's consider the next area in, in which the Lord calls us to love Him and, of course, our neighbor, and that is in our sexuality, that we are to keep ourselves pure and help others to be pure. What I'd like us to do is consider three things what the seventh commandment is saying, which is not difficult to understand, the ways in which it may be broken, and then how it may be applied more broadly. So first of all, what is the commandment saying? Well, the Lord tells us in the seventh commandment, you shall not commit adultery. Now the word means to have sexual relations outside of marriage. Now instead of using the word sexual relations throughout the sermon, I'm just going to use an abbreviation and say relations. It means to have relations with someone other than your spouse, whether or not that other person is married. It can also mean if you're not married, to have relations with someone who is. And of course, as I've mentioned, there's a broader application of this we're going to be looking at uh, later in the sermon. But let me just say at this particular point, this commandment assumes, as does all of Scripture, a biblical definition of marriage. We do need to understand that this commandment is, is broad. 
Now, God originally established marriage to be a blessing to mankind, to be a covenant, a contract that would provide companionship. It wasn't good for the man to be alone. It's a covenant between one man and one woman. Uh, God said in Genesis 2.18, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Uh, I'll skip the part where it says he created all the animals, brought them to Adam, see what he would call them and so forth. And essentially, if we were to look at that, I would just say this as, a, as an interesting point. Uh, the Lord in Genesis 2.18, or I should say Moses, as he's recording this, is not telling us that God makes the observation, it's not good for man to be alone, and then he brings all these animals to Adam to see if he can find a companion uh, among the animals, because after he names them all, looks at them all, there's nothing that's suitable for him. Actually, that event takes place in the past, before the Lord says it's not good for the man to be alone. Adam went out and he named the animals and he saw that among the animal kingdom there was an animal that corresponded, a male and its female, throughout all the creatures that God had made. But Adam, in doing so, recognized there was not one like that for him. The Lord then makes this observation, it's not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper that is suitable for him. So we read in verses 21 through 24. So the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. The Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. Now again, this is the institution of marriage. Anything other than this is not marriage regardless of what anyone says, regardless of leaders of state, regardless of what the people of the world may think or desire, there is only one institution of marriage that God ordained, and this is what it is between one man and one woman. Marriage is a blessing given by God that is meant to be, in this case, as we're looking at the seventh commandment, an exclusive relationship between one man and one woman, for the entirety of their lives, one in which they separate themselves from all others and keep themselves only for themselves. Now, secondly, how can this commandment be broken? Well, we already, I think, know the, the obvious way. I've already mentioned it. And that's by bringing somebody else into this relationship, by failing to keep it exclusively between yourself and your spouse or if you're not married, by having relations with someone who is married to someone else. Now along these lines, the Lord tells us that there is another way that we may commit this sin. It's really not another way, it's really the same way, but perhaps we don't recognize it as such, and that is through unlawful divorce and remarriage. Now I don't have time to deal with this fully, but I thought I should say a few things about it because our Lord tells us that if we divorce a spouse and we don't have biblical grounds and marry somebody else, we commit adultery. We read in Matthew 19, verses 3 through 9. Some Pharisees came to Jesus, testing him and asking, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? And he answered and said, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. They said to him, why then did Moses command to give her a certificate of divorce and send her away? He said to them, because of your hardness of heart, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning, it has not been this way. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. So here again, we have another way of, of committing adultery. Jesus tells us that if we divorce our spouse and marry somebody else without biblical grounds for that divorce, 
we commit adultery against them. And the reason for that is, without biblical grounds, there is no biblical divorce. We're still in a marriage relationship. And if we have relations with someone else, which we would do if we divorced and remarried, we would commit adultery because now we've let somebody else into this relationship. Now we do need to note here that there are biblical grounds for divorce. The biblical grounds according to Jesus in verse 9 is immorality, which is a broad term that refers in different contexts to sexual uncleanness, but in this context refers primarily to adultery. If your spouse commits adultery, now of course they can, they can repent and they can be forgiven, but if they commit adultery and they refuse to repent, then the Lord says you may divorce them biblically, at which time that marriage comes to an end and that you may marry another without committing adultery because you are no longer married to your previous spouse. Now, if Jesus wasn't saying that, what he says actually makes no sense at all. He gives an exception. And that exception is immorality in the marriage covenant. And I do believe that means unrepentant immorality. A marriage relationship may be disrupted in that way very severely, and yet there still can be forgiveness and reconciliation. We need to remember that as well. Now, Paul gives to us another grounds in 1 Corinthians 7, verses 12 through 16. Paul writes to the Corinthians, but to the rest I say, uh, not the Lord. And what he means is Jesus didn't address this. And to the rest, that means not two believers married, but now a mixed marriage. That if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever, and she consents to live with him, he must not divorce her. And the woman who has an unbelieving husband, he consents to live with her, she must not send her husband away. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified through his wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified through her believing husband. For otherwise, your children are unclean, but now they are holy. Yet, if the unbelieving one leaves, let him leave. The brother or the sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. For how do you know, O wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, O husband? whether you will save your wife. Essentially, what Paul is saying here is that if the unbeliever wants to leave, that the believer must not do anything to stop them because if they want to leave and you try to keep them in the marriage relationship, there isn't going to be peace. The Lord has called us to peace. And if they leave, the brother or sister is not under bondage. If you marry an unbeliever, contrary to what the Lord tells us to do because we are only to marry in the Lord. And then you come to yourself, you realize what you've done, and you repent. The Lord says you need to stay in that marriage as long as your spouse desires to remain in it with the hope, Paul says, that the Lord might mercifully, through your example and your testimony, bring that spouse to himself that they might be saved. Now, the same could happen if two professing believers marry only to discover that one isn't really converted, or if two unbelievers marry and then one of them is converted. You can come into the situation in a variety of ways. If the believer wants out, again, Paul says, the believing spouse is not to try and stop them. And he also says the brother or sister is not bound to that marriage because the Lord has called us to peace. Now, the question that usually arises is this. What about the person who divorces their spouse without biblical grounds, marries somebody else, and commits adultery. If they repent, do they need to divorce the new spouse and remarry their former spouse so that they don't live in perpetual adultery? Well, I think the answer to that question has to be clearly no. They have to stay in that marriage because for one thing, the Lord expressly forbids if you divorce and remarry, that you are not to go back to your previous spouse. He says that in Deuteronomy 24, verses 1 through 4, and this is the same passage that was in question when the Pharisees came to Jesus and said, is it lawful to divorce your spouse for any reason at all? They were talking about this text. 
But this is what Moses writes, when a man takes a wife and marries her and it happens that she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her and he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out from his house and she leaves his house and goes and becomes another man's wife and if the latter husband turns against her and writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house, or if the latter husband dies, who took her to be his wife, then the former husband who sent her away is not allowed to take her again to be his wife since she has been defiled. For that is an abomination before the Lord, and you shall not bring sin on the land which the Lord your God gives you as an inheritance. I, I'm not aware of anything in the New Covenant that would mitigate against what the Lord gave in this particular instance. Now, for another reason, I do think that the adultery that is committed when somebody unlawfully divorces a spouse and remarries is something that occurs, although maybe, maybe this could be argued, but I think it's only the first time that they have relations that constitutes adultery. Because after it has been committed, then the grounds that weren't there for the disillusionment of the first marriage are now there. Now the previous marriage covenant is broken, and the new one, I believe, becomes valid, though what has been done is sin. And they are guilty of committing that sin until they repent. But when they repent, I believe that that sin, like any other sin, is forgiven of the Lord. And one thing I think that points us in this direction, there's actually several things, but I'll just give you one example, is the fact that when Jesus was ministering to the Samaritan woman at the well, he recognized the fact that she had been married five times. In John 4, verses 16 through 18, uh, he says to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you have correctly said, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. This you have said truly. Now, unless all five of these men died while she was married to them or at some particular juncture, Jesus here is at least recognizing that she was married five times and that she had five husbands. She was in five legitimate marriage covenants and now she's living with somebody whom she's not married to. Jesus doesn't say, you're still married to one of these previous five. You have correctly said, you have no husband. He recognized that that marriage covenant that she was in previously had been dissolved, okay? So he recognized that yes, somebody can have multiple marriages. Is he telling us that that's good and that's what we ought to have? No, but he is saying that there are things that break the marriage covenant so that one may enter into another covenant. But if it isn't done on the proper grounds, it is adultery, but yet even that adultery can be forgiven and that marriage can be a valid marriage in the eyes of the Lord. But the principle here is the same. One is guilty of adultery if they have relations with someone other than the one to whom they are bound together in the marriage covenant. So this is the point. If we are to love the Lord and our neighbor, we need to be faithful to our marriage covenants. We need to keep ourselves exclusively for our spouses. Now finally, let's consider a broader application of this principle. And this, I think, is more applicable perhaps to us than the previous uh, things we've been looking at, although all of these things are true. Now, what we saw in the Sixth Commandment is equally true here. This commandment may be broken not just in our actions, but it may also be broken in our thoughts and our desires. Remember what we read this morning in Matthew 5, verses 27 through 28. Jesus, or excuse me, you have heard, Jesus says, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now the question is, if you keep yourself exclusively for your spouse, you don't commit the action of, of 
relations with someone else other than your spouse, have you kept the seventh commandment? Well, that's what the Pharisees thought. That's what Jesus is dispelling here, the idea that you haven't done it just because you've kept the letters. It can be violated in other ways. The Pharisees thought they had kept it, but Jesus tells them it was otherwise. If we look, Jesus says, at someone other than our spouse and desire to have relations with them, we have broken this commandment. Now, we do need to understand that the word Jesus uses here means to have a strong desire. It doesn't mean simply to find someone attractive. That's not what he's saying. Find someone attractive. Oops, I've committed adultery. It means you look at somebody and you lust after them and you desire to have relations with them. That is how this is broken in the heart. So if that's what you have towards someone other than your spouse, Jesus says you've committed adultery in your heart, you've committed adultery in your mind. Now I do believe that there is a difference between that and the actual act. I don't think it is as bad as committing the actual act, but it's still a violation of this principle. It violates the principle of love. And so it is sin that we need to repent of. And we all need to guard our hearts and not allow these thoughts to be there. Uh, take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Those that are in the world that are seeking to tear down what the Lord is actually saying to us, his truth, but also those that are in our minds that get in that tell us this is okay. It isn't okay. We need to keep our minds and thoughts pure. Now, if we include the principle that we are to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. This commandment also tells us that we need to be careful not to do the things that would cause someone else to desire us in this way. Now, here's a few simple principles. Be careful where you dress and undress, not in front of an open window. Be careful what you wear. Be careful how you act. Be careful what you say, because all these things can provoke desire in others. There's a mutual responsibility here. We need to make sure that we're not looking and lusting. We need to make sure that we're not giving other people the occasion to look and lust, as it were, after us. Now, this is something, again, that men perhaps have a, a greater difficulty with than women. And let me just say something I think we all know is obviously true. Ladies, you need to know how vulnerable men are in this area. The Lord has given beauty to women, something that's very attractive to men. And if you are not careful, you can be like a flame that is applied to gasoline. You just need to be aware and be careful what you do. Now, finally, let's not forget that this commandment also forbids fornication or relations outside of the marriage covenant between a man and a woman who are not married. And that's actually what Paul was addressing in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 15 through 20. He says, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? You, you, you're united with Christ through faith in him by his Holy Spirit. Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? May it never be. Or do you not know that the one who joins himself to a prostitute is one body with her? For he says the two shall become one flesh. But the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body, but the immoral man sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. The Lord wants us to keep ourselves pure in our marriage relationships, but he wants us to keep ourselves pure for outside of a marriage relationship and to keep those around us pure. I don't know what your experiences has been, but as I recall um, when I was younger and uh, in relationship with, with the gal who is my wife now, we kept ourselves pure. We didn't want to lose the Lord's blessing on our relationship. And yet there were so many people professing to be Christians who were using these justifications, well, we love each other. We're, we're intending to get married. 
or were engaged. And so they went ahead and engaged in, in these relations. But if you're not married, the Lord says you are not to have relations or allow yourself to get into a situation where you will be tempted to have relations, but you are to keep yourselves pure. The Lord made this to be a blessing, this, you know, relations, but he has made it only for the marriage covenant, and anything else is sin. And it falls short of the love that the Lord calls us to show him. He wants us to keep ourselves pure. It falls short of what the Lord calls us to do with regard to our neighbor. He wants us to keep not only ourselves pure, but he wants us also to do everything we can to keep our neighbor pure as well. Now this is how the Lord defines love. And let me just mention, this is what he gives us the power to do. This is what he gives us the desire to do by his Holy Spirit who lives in our hearts. He gives us the desire to keep ourselves pure and holy so that when the Lord does give us that relationship, you know, we will be able to enjoy that blessing and know that we haven't stumbled other people. And I should mention too, if, if, if in our lives we, we have violated this principle and we have fallen into sexual immorality outside of marriage, that there is still, of course, forgiveness and mercy and cleansing with the Lord, there is always the second chance, and we need to remember that if we are trusting. We don't use this as an excuse to fall into sin, but when we have fallen into sin, we should not despair because if we confess our sins, the Lord will cleanse us, and we get to start over. That is the mercy of the Lord, but again, the point is that we shouldn't fall into that sin for that reason. Instead, we should set our hearts to love and honor the Lord in the way that he has called us, in our actions, in our words, in our thoughts, in our desires, that we would do all and be what the Lord would call us to be. Remember, he calls us to be like Jesus. That's what we need to be aiming for. So may the Lord strengthen his love in our hearts and make us to be more like our Savior, the Lord Jesus, whom we love more than any other. Well, let's, uh, let's take a few moments and bow in silent prayer, and let's, if we've violated these principles, confess our sins to the Lord and ask Him for the grace that we need to do what He calls us to do.